One of the most important aspects of early pediatric care is ensuring that a child is growing uh, at the rate that they should be growing and that they are healthy. So failure to thrive is actually when uh, that is not happening. We're going to go over uh, just a brief overview of what failure to thrive is and isn't. We'll go over some of these subtypes. Traditionally, failure to thrive is divided up into organic and non-organic, but this really is not uh, a, a, an adequate uh, classification of failure to thrive because a lot of children have uh, a little bit of both. And so we're going to divide this up into inadequate cal caloric intake, inadequate absorption, uh, increased metabolism, and defective utilization. We'll also talk about the history and physical of the child, uh, and then some of the things that might lead you to believe that there might be failure to thrive. The workup, uh, in cases where you suspect that this is really a probably an organic cause, uh, or probably not a uh, non-organic cause. And then also the management. So this is the growth chart for children aged 2 to 20 years. Uh, but particularly when we're talking about failure to thrive, uh, we're really going to be concerned about looking at this growth chart from uh, birth to 36 months of age. So this is an example of a growth chart of a boy who has failure to thrive. Uh, note both the length here and the weight. So we're going to look at each of these periods. So child was born in the 30th percentile, so pretty normal. At one month, however, they were at the 10th percentile. Now, this is important uh, because at this point, the child is really close already to failure to thrive, the definition uh, that's commonly accepted of failure to thrive. Uh, by the second vi visit, at the second, uh, the second month visit, uh, the child's already at the fifth percentile uh, for, uh, for, for weight. Now note that the height is still at the 25th percentile. And this is something that's worth recognizing, is that height, when we're talking about failure to thrive or chronic uh, undernutrition, height is something that usually is going to manifest uh, later, uh, a, poor, a low height. Uh, but weight will manifest very early on. By the third month visit, the child is already below the first, first percentile, and this is going to persist um, continuously all the way into the first, uh, first year uh, of age. So this child, their birth weight was seven pounds. At five months of age, roughly around that four to five month uh, of age period, we expect the baby's birth weight to have doubled, uh, which would be 14 pounds, but this child is only a around 11 pounds. And then at one year of age, we expect the child's birth weight to have tripled. This child is only 15.5 pounds, so just a little bit over doubling. Failure to thrive is a failure to grow at uh, the expected rate given the child's age. And historically, as I mentioned, this is divided into organic and non-organic, which would be environmental causes. Uh, but a lot of times a child will have features of both. So just saying that this is organic failure to thrive or non-organic failure to thrive, they're not mutually exclusive. So it's really uh, that's not really a good classification system. Uh, so we uh, we have we, we need to classify this uh, a little bit uh, more sophisticatedly. Some misperceptions regarding failure to thrive. So one misperception would be failure to thrive is most commonly due to neglect and malnutrition, and that's a myth. Uh, now, while malnutrition is a really common, it is a common cause of failure to thrive, especially worldwide and in uh, in third world countries or in countries where there's a lot of poverty. And while physicians should always be wary of neglect in any child, and we'll look at some, uh, some features on a physical exam that might point you towards that, failure to thrive is most commonly due, more commonly due to illnesses or parental misconceptions uh, regarding proper feeding or difficulty with feeding. Failure to thrive, another misperception is that failure to thrive can be diagnosed whenever a child crosses down percentile. So we think of you know, that children should not cross down percentiles. For the most part, they really don't that much. Uh, but this isn't always the case. About 25% of children younger than age 2 will change percentiles. So they might be born at a weight of the 50th percentile. But age 2, they might be at the 35th percentile. And that's, that's normal. Uh, typically, children tend to be around the same percentiles. But about 25% of children will cross percentiles. 
but most clinicians will consider crossing two major percentile lines, and that's these these lines right here, 97, 90, 75, oh, sorry, that's for length, 97, 90, 75, uh, 50, 25, 10, and 3. So I guess they're the same numbers. Um, if you cross two of these lines down, then that's typically considered by most clinicians to be failure to thrive. Also important, remember to ensure that growth is correctly plotted on the chart. A diagnosis of failure to thrive necessitates admission for observation. Again, not always. Uh, so while it's true that severe failure to thrive and suspected neglect cases should be admitted for observation, mild cases uh, in which you've uh, typically diagnosed a cause uh, or uh, you know that there may be uh, a parental misconception regarding proper feeding and you provide the education for that, typically these uh, children can be sent home with proper instructions and then follow up after a week. So these are some of the subtypes of failure to thrive that we mentioned earlier. So inadequate caloric intake. Uh, this would be something like incorrect preparation of formula, inadequate breast milk intake, mechanic feeding difficulties on behalf of the baby, so poor latching, poor suck reflex, congenital anomalies, poverty, neglect, and then fad diets. Now, I say fad diets here, that sounds kind of, uh, that sounds like kind of a bad thing. Some parents do do these fad diets where they think uh, that their children for sure should not be getting uh, any gluten or uh, perhaps they're vegan. Uh, that might be considered a fad diet that, you know, it doesn't sound like a very nice way to call it. Uh, some parents have uh, legitimate uh, religious or cultural reasons behind a specific diet. But the fact of the matter is some of these diets are very difficult to apply to a young child uh, that has much different needs calorically and nutritionally than an adult does. Uh, so if most diets are compatible uh, with a, 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 an okay, a, a fine pediatric diet, but you have to make some adjustments. Uh, it's not, you, you can't just give them the same foods as adults. Uh, so just remember that. these different diets uh, that differ from the, the normal American diet, some of these can, uh, can lead to inadequate caloric intake for a child. Uh, inadequate absorption, these are going to be diseases. Celiac disease is a very common one, uh, and it's, they say it's becoming more common, but that's probably because we're diagnosing more cases because we're more aware of it. Cystic fibrosis, typically that's discovered on the, uh, on the newborn uh, screening test. Cow's milk enteropathy, remember that children under the age of one should not be given cow's milk. Vitamin or mineral deficiency, scurvy, vitamin C deficiency. Uh, biliary atresia or liver disease, and that's going to be caused uh, because of, that's going to be due to malabsorption because you're not getting the bio into the intestinal tract. Other causes include increased metabolism, so you're going to be burning more calories than you're taking in. Hyperthyroidism, chronic infection or immunodeficiency chronic disease such as renal insufficiency, a malignant process, uh, or hypoxemia. In this case, uh, congest uh, congenital heart disease, chronic anemia, or lung diseases. Some of these don't really fall into increased metabolism, but we're just going to put it under uh, these, uh, this category. And then finally, defective utilization. This can be something like Down syndrome. And uh, it's important to remember that with Down syndrome, we actually use a special growth chart because we know that they have a uh, slower growth. So we are going to put them on their own growth chart uh, so that we don't mistakenly diagnose failure, failure to thrive. You have to put them on their own growth chart. Uh, we have a standardized idea of how children with Down syndrome are going to grow. Diabetes mellitus type 1 can cause uh, defective utilization because you're not getting sugar into the cells. Metabolic disorders such as lysosomal storage diseases and amino acid metabolism defects. And then uh, if the child is born with a congenital affection, that can lead to uh, de defective utilization of, uh, of nutrients. So this list uh, together, this is not exhaustive. There can be more things, but these kind of hit on some of the, uh, of the common ones. So this is a... Uh, these are some of the common uh, non-organic uh, issues surrounding failure to thrive. Uh, so these are, you could also call this common mistakes of, uh, that parents make, and it's perfectly 
perfectly fine. You know, this doesn't mean that the parent is neglectful or anything. But, you know, remember, babies don't come with uh, an instruction, uh, an instruction booklet. Uh, so it's it's not uncommon for a parent to, to make a mistake, and that's okay, and it's our responsibility to be understanding and to provide proper parental education. So, for instance, over dilution of a standard formula, of course, that's going to be a problem because if you measure the formula out and you say, my child should be getting X amount of bottles per day, and you've actually diluted the formula too much, then they're going to get extra water and not enough nutrients. Uh, so standard formula contains 20 kilocalories per ounce, and then over uh, dilution is going to reduce the caloric concentration in the formula. Uh, if the uh, parent uses condensed milk to make formula, uh, this uh, is going to uh, uh, give inadequate protein, and that's going to uh, reduce growth rate. Uh, a child that's a preemie who's on standard formula that's a no-no. Remember, preemies have their own formula that they should be using. Cereal in the bottle, this also dilutes caloric density. Uh, if there's a worry whether food will run out before there's money to buy more, this is something totally different. This suggests possibly poverty, socioeconomic causes, and this is actually considered the first and most sensitive question in the CDC food, and, uh, food insecurity questionnaire. And so this is another uh, another perspective you need to look at is, you know, there are a lot of parents out there that are poor, uh, and so they might be trying to skimp on the money by not feeding their child enough, and that's not always their fault. So uh, you want to ask this, because there are programs out there, uh, such as WIC, Women, Infants, and Children, uh, that uh, can provide subsidies for these parents to uh, make sure that their kids are getting enough food. Uh, if there's no vitamin and mineral preparation in a uh, former preemie baby who's also receiving cow's milk, uh, this is obviously really bad. Preemies are prone to vitamin D deficiency and iron deficiencies, and cow's milk can exacerbate that. Infrequent feeding, again, this is usually due to parental miseducation or lack of parental education. And so in these cases, you can set these parents up with a dietitian uh, who specializes in pediatrics, or you can just give them the advice yourself. Uh, and uh, so you can make sure that the parents are, uh, are sufficiently uh, feeding their children and making sure that they're getting sufficient calories in their diet. So a history is going to be one of the most important things you're going to do in uh, examining these children because uh, a history, if you get a really good history, it can help you identify some of these more easily addressed and some of the more common causes of failure to thrive, such as what we uh, just looked at in the previous slide. So, for example, you'll want to know about the feeding schedules and practices. You want to know about the frequency of feeding, how many meals the child is having per day, maybe they're a little bit older. Uh, for young children, for babies, you want to know what kind of formula they're using, making sure they're using it properly, making sure they're following the instructions on the back of the can. Uh, if they're breastfeeding, uh, making sure that they're breastfeeding properly, that there's appropriate latch and sucking. Uh, if, we want, we want to know uh, what kind of diet the child is on, if it's a vegan or vegetarian diet, uh, what types of food are eaten. A lot of times parents are very restrictive, want to make sure that their kid is eating healthy, but also in that case a child might not eat enough food and may be uh, calorically malnourished. And so in that case, it's uh, important to tell the parent really try to feed the child foods that they like. That's the most important thing, that they're getting enough calories. Um, you can always give them a multivitamin to make sure that they're getting uh, their vitamins and minerals. And then any particular dietary practices for social or cultural or religious reasons. Of course, you want to know the social and economic conditions, poverty being number one. Uh, and, and then if so, uh, we, want to, uh, we want to educate them about the utilization of social programs. We can put them in contact with a social worker who's going to be uh, really good at putting them in touch with various officials who can uh, help them with that. We want to know about the family dynamics. Uh, if there's other care caregivers besides the primary caregiver that's taking care of the child, these people are going to need to be educated too. Daycare use um, and so forth. 
We want to know about the timing of developmental milestones. This gives us an idea about not only is a child growing enough on the outside, but are they growing enough on the inside where they're developing their motor, uh, their fine motor skills, their gross motor skills, uh, social skills, uh, language skills, etc. Because those can all be affected too. We want to know about the OB history particularly with uh, the, the, uh, the birth of this child, the pregnancy of this child. Uh, we want to know about the pregnancy course, if there are any general complications, were there infections, were there substance use, alcohol use, cigarette use, and so forth. We want to know about the neonatal history of this child, how old were they at birth. Remember that children who are premature, they need to have their, uh, they need to have uh, on their growth chart, needs to be adjusted for their, uh, for their uh, prematurity. We also want to know what their APGARs were, their percentiles at birth, their neonatal course uh, after birth, and then uh, we want to also review their newborn screening tests if they haven't, if they've gotten it, and if they haven't, you should you should get one uh, on the child. And then the past medical history of the child, anything that's recent as far as GI symptoms, uh, vomiting, constipation, diarrhea, dysphagia, stooling, uh, any malabsorptive symptoms if they've had a history of chronic infection. Uh, current or recent medical conditions, uh, and then a review of symptoms as you would do on all patients. So a very extensive history, but this can really help you uh, find out some of these uh, more common and more easily addressed causes of failure to thrive. On your physical exam, you're going to do, again, this is going to be really comprehensive, uh, but you want to focus on the systems of concern based off the history if you think that this is possibly a medical cause. So you want to, of course, get your vital signs, especially make sure that you're looking at the color. If the child's pale, you might think possibly there's an anemia. You want to look at the skin and hair. Um, so uh, particularly things like uh, poor hygiene, trauma, and burns may suggest a, abuse or neglect. Uh, look at the heads, uh, the fontanelles, if they're swollen, that can uh, mean there might be an infection. Uh, if they haven't closed yet, and they should have prematurely closed fontanelles, uh, can uh, can push you towards possibly a congenital disorder. Also, if there's frontal bossing, uh, abnormal facies, or dysmorphia, that can push you towards a congenital disorder as well. The conjunctiva can help you uh, determine if there might be an anemia process. Fundoscopic exam and looking at the pupils uh, can help you see if there uh, is possibly a congenital infection. Uh, again, looking at the ears, size, shape, and position, uh, those are also typically features of dysmorphia. Uh, and then also looking at the uh, tympanic membrane, the ear is a very common place that's affected in some of these uh, congenital uh, immunodeficiencies. Looking at the mouth and the pharynx, uh, especially the breath odor, that can point you towards that there might be a metabolic disorder. Look at the neck, there's webs. Uh, or a redundant skin that can point you towards particularly Turner syndrome, but also something called Noonan syndrome, which can also affect boys. You want to look at the palpate, the thyroid. Uh, this can point you towards a hypothyroidism or a hyperthyroidism. Uh, you want to look at the uh, genitals, palpate, uh, sorry, the abdomen. Uh, you want to palpate the abdomen, listen to the abdomen, not in that order. You know, listen to the abdomen first, then palpate the abdomen. Uh, make sure you feel the liver and spleen, uh, look at the umbilicus. You want to uh, consider the general appearance of the genitalia. And if you suspect abuse based on previous, uh, on your history and uh, physical exam uh, issues, uh, then you should do a pelvic exam uh, on, uh, on girls. Uh, extremities and skeletal exam, uh, you should be looking for uh, any kind of edema, uh, abnormality of the digits, which can point you towards congenital issues, joints, and spinal alignment. Neurologically, you're going to look at uh, cranial nerves, deep tendon reflexes, tone, suck and swallow response. And then psychiatrically, you want to look at the appearance of the child, uh, their activity, their affect, behavior towards caregiver. Again, this can point you towards things like abuse, neglect, and behavioral issues. So all of these things need to be taken uh, together and, uh, and then correlated with the history uh, to uh, come up with uh, a differential. Your workup, now this is controversial. Uh, whether or not you're going to just go in and do the workup, laboratory workup right away, uh, or if you wait. So Typically, you're going to do this blood workup if 
you suspect that this is probably not an or, a non-organic cause. Uh, so if you go down the list of these non-organic causes or these uh, inadequate caloric intake or issues with parents feeding the children properly, uh, then you should do a laboratory workup because this will help you uh, diagnose some medical problems that may be present. Uh, if, if you suspect that this is a feeding issue or something like that, uh, then you can hold out on these. Uh, but if you suspect a, a, a bona fide medical issue is behind the failure to thrive, then you're going to want to get these labs. Uh, as far as USMLE, uh, I would err on the side of getting these labs unless it's really clear that there's something, uh, something non-organic going on. Uh, so you'll want to get a complete metabolic profile. Uh, you'll get a CBC. You get a urinalysis, serum proteins, stool ova and parasites, and a uh, sweat chloride test. And this would be if you suspect CF or if the newborn screening has not been performed. Other tests can be done based on clinical suspicion. So for instance, if the child has uh, symptoms consistent with malabsorption, so they have failure to thrive, plus signs of ADE or K deficiencies, uh, you'll want to get endomesial, anti-endomesial antibodies, anti-tissue transglutaminase antibodies, and that will point you towards celiac disease if those are positive. And if you suspect Turner syndrome in a, a girl, you can get a karyotype. Management is uh, going to differ based on the severity uh, or whether neglect uh, or abuse is suspected. So if this is just a mild failure to thrive, you're going to manage uh, the underlying cause uh, or provide parent education regarding proper feeding practices uh, and the amount of nutrition that's required based on the child's age. And children with failure to thrive will require 150% of their daily needs until they've caught up to normal. And normal is typically considered uh, their birth percentile or roughly the 50th percentile. You want these parents, uh, you're going to follow up in, in a week. And so what you want is these parents to uh, do a one-week food diary, uh, making sure that they uh, write down how much the child ate, when they ate it, and uh, if there were any issues with feeding uh, or if there's any issues with vomiting, of course, um, and so forth. Uh, you'll follow up again in one week. Children should gain about two ounces per day if they're properly, uh, if they have proper nutrition after failure to thrive. You'll consult with a dietitian or specialist in complicated cases, particularly if there's a diagnosis of celiac disease. The celiac diet is a very difficult diet to maintain. So celiac disease, remember, is a disease where uh, the intestines inflame to a uh, protein in uh, wheat products called gliadin. And unfortunately, this is not restricted to just wheat products. We use wheat products in a lot of things other than bread and pasta and what we usually consider wheat products. You can get wheat products in sauces. You can get wheat products even in multivitamins or in pills. So uh, a lot of times if we have a child with celiac disease, in most cases if you have anybody with celiac disease, you're going to have these uh, people in consultation with a dietitian who can really help them uh, specialize their diet for, um, for celiac disease. And there are other things, uh, other complicated cases where you may want to consult with a dietitian or another specialist. Now, on the other hand, in moderate to severe failure to thrive, uh, if the child is really malnourished, or if this outpatient management has failed, or if there is ever neglect uh, or abuse suspected, then the child is going to be admitted for uh, observation. And so you'll do observed feeding over three to seven days. Uh, if you're giving them 100 to 120 kilocalories per kilogram per day, they should gain about two ounces per day. Other labs and consults uh, will be done as necessary based on, uh, based on any suspected underlying process, if there's a medical uh, process that we suspect is underlying. Parent education, if this, if this is really a non-organic issue with feeding or something of that nature. Uh, mandatory social services and child protective services notification if there's neglect or abuse suspected, and this is really important. So again, remembering back to uh, your history, uh, physical exam, does the child look like they're neglected? Usually if a child looks like they're neglected, they're going to have really bad hygiene, 
Uh, they're going to be skinny. You're going to see ribs. Um, their clothes are going to look dirty. Uh, if they're abused, you may see uh, burn marks, bruises of various stages of healing, and so forth. And then, of course, these children, when you, when you send them home, if you send them home, you want to do a frequent follow-up to make sure that they uh, are catching up uh, to the appropriate uh, uh, percentile. Um, and so we want to see these children typically about every week.